Hey guys, in this tutorial, I'll be showing you how to create two different jumps for your game. So the first one is what I call a glide jump. And the way it works is that if you just press the space bar once, you'll do a normal jump. But if you hold down the space bar, you will glide. And eventually you'll kind of run out of power and you'll fall back to the ground. And so the longer you hold down the space bar, you can see if I let go early, I'll fall down earlier. Um, so the longer you hold down the space bar, the higher you'll glide up. But eventually you'll fall back to the ground. And the other type of jump, um, let me just go ahead and switch the component over to use the strafe jump. So the way the strafe jump works is, again, you can jump by pressing space and it'll just do a normal jump. But if you jump another time when you're in the air, it will strafe you in the direction that you're pressing. So if I jump and I'm holding down left, you'll see I'll do a little strafe to the right, or the left, sorry. And same thing with right. But you don't have to strafe in the direction you're facing. You can see I can run forward and hold down back and I can strafe backwards. And I can do it on an angle. Um, pretty much whatever key, you know, whatever keys you're holding down, um, it will strafe you in that direction. And one other thing to note about this one is that, like, if you walk off a cliff and you do a jump before you hit the ground, it will count as a strafe. So you can still strafe one time even if you fall off of a cliff. And something that's pretty cool about both these jumps is that they're controlled through something called float curves. So you can see I have up here a glide curve and a strafe curve. And I'm just going to really quickly explain what these are because we'll go ahead and create them later and it'll make a little bit more sense then. But all this is saying is that, so let's go back to the glide curve. So the X value here is time and the Y value is the velocity of the character. So it's just velocity over time. So you can see when the glide first starts, he's going to have a velocity of 400 and then it'll go up to 500 after about half a second. And then after about two seconds, his velocity will go all the way back down to zero, which is why he kind of floats up there for a little bit. And so you can see if I change this and maybe I'll make him, his velocity go up a lot higher and I'll make him stay in the air a lot longer. I can do that just by adjusting this float curve. So if I do it now, oh, I forgot to change it back to the glide component. So if I switch it back to the glide component and I hold down space, you can see I go up a little, a little bit higher and I can hover up here a lot longer because I, all I did was adjust that float curve. And the stra strafe curve works the exact same way. So it's just a really simple way to adjust. Um, you like make tweaks to these things without having to go in and edit the code. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So I'm gonna open up the Epic Game Launcher and I'm on version 4.24.3, but you can launch whatever version you want. I'd recommend being on this one or newer though, just so there's no conflicts. And then we wanna select games down here at the bottom, hit next. And then we want to use the third person blueprint. So select that and press next. And then I'm just gonna call this jump in and then go ahead and create project. Make sure you have blueprint and no starter content selected because we don't really need either of those. And while that's creating, I'm just gonna bring this over here just so I can kind of reference it. Okay, so the way this is gonna work is we're gonna have a base jump component that our glide jump and our strafe jump are gonna inherit from. And so any functionality that is shared between the two jump components is gonna be in the base class. And then anything that is specific to a um, certain type of jump is gonna be in that child class. So let's go ahead and create the base class first. So right click, I'm just gonna create a new folder for this and I'm gonna call it jump component. So inside of here, right click and we wanna create a new blueprint class called or of type actor component so select actor component and we'll call it bp underscore jump component base because it is the base class for the jump component so if you double click or double click on that to open it up we can go up here to the top where it says class settings and since it's a base class we want to expand this and we want to say create abstract class which will just make it so that we cannot spawn an instance of it and go ahead and compile and save that. So again, this is the parent class. So anything we put in here is going to be relevant for both of the jump components. All right, so let's go over here on the left and fill out some of the functions that we're gonna need. So the first one we're gonna need is a function for jumping. And then we're gonna need another one for stop jumping. And we wanna have one more for when he lands. So we'll call that on landed. So these are the three functions that um, all jump components are gonna share because they all need to be notified when you jump, when you stop jumping, and when you land. So let's go over to the event graph real quick. 
because we want to do something here in the begin play. Um, we basically just want to save a copy of the character that this component belongs to so that we can get access to it um, easily later on. So in the begin play, which is essentially just when this component gets created, let's right click and say get owner. So this is going to give us the owner of the component, but um, we this is a actor if you hover over it, but we know that the owner of this component is going to be a character, or unless we require it to be a character. Um, you could technically add it to any actor, but for our purposes, we're going to require that it only gets added to a character. So to do that, let's cast it to a character. Oops, that's not it. Cast to character. And if it succeeds, then everything's good. So let's right click on this down here and say promote to variable. And you can see it adds a variable over here on the left. And let's rename this to the owning character. And we'll set it to private as well and add it to a private category. But if it fails, um, which means that this component was added to some actor that was not a character, then that's kind of a weird case because we don't really know how to handle that. So we're just going to go ahead and destroy our component. And you might want to print an error message here or something just in case um, you have a, somebody else on your project who tries to add this to something that isn't a character. But we're just going to say, hey, we only support adding this component to characters. All right, so now that we have the owning character saved. Um, that's pretty much all we really need to do in this class. Um, oh, I, oh, I lied. So go to the jump component. Um, so by default, we want the jump behavior to just act the same way it does in Unreal. Um, and to do that, we can say owning character, which is just this variable over here, and drag it for that and say jump and hook this up. So all this is doing is just the same thing that happens when you jump um, in a normal game. So this is kind of like the base behavior for all the jump components is just to do the normal uh, Unreal Engine 4 jump. And we want to do the same thing for stop jumping as well. So drag in the owning character and say stop jumping. Like so. And I believe that's pretty much all the actual functionality. There are two more little helper functions I'm going to create that we'll end up using later. So come here to the top, make a new function and call it get jump count. And we want to set this to pure and we want to set it to constant. And I'm going to add it to a, oh, sorry, we want to set it to protected as well. And then we want to add it to a protected category. And if you don't know what a protected um, access specifier is, it's basically just saying that um, only this class and children of this class can have access to this function. And that's exactly the case that we want because only the children of this class are going to be calling get jump count. We don't want somebody else outside of this class calling this because it wouldn't really make any sense, or at least they don't need to call it. So we're going to make it protected. And then we're going to go ahead and we'll just duplicate that again. And we'll call it get owning character, which this is just a helper function to get access to this character since this is set to private. So just drag this in, hook this up, and hook that up. Okay, so I think our base class is totally finished at this point. So now that we have the base class created, we can go back and create the, um, the child classes. So let's go back to the content directory. And right next to it, we can right click, select blueprint class, and hit this little drop down here. So we want to be able to find all the classes and search for our BP underscore jump component class and click on this class. So this is the class that we just created over here. And we're saying we want this to be the parent. So if we click on that, we can name this BP underscore uh, glide jump component. And then we want to do another one. So right click and just duplicate the, the uh, glide jump component and call it strafe jump component. So these are the two child classes. So we have our base class, which is our jump component base. And then we have our glide jump and our strafe jump. And these are both children of that base class. Because if you come up here and click class settings, you can see the parent class is set to our jump component. All right, so inside of here, we basically just need to add the functionality that's specific to that type of jump. So I think we'll go ahead and do the glide jump first, because I think it's a little easier, maybe. So open up the, the glide jump, BP glide jump. 
And inside of here, the first thing we want to do is override the jump function. So hit this little override, and you can see down here, these last three, these are the functions that we defined in our base class. So we can override any of them. So for this one, we want to override the jump component first. And inside of the jump function, the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we can actually jump. So we'll say get owning character. And again, this is just the function we made back over here in our jump component base. Get owning character. All it does is return the character that owns this um, component. And we'll say can jump. Can jump. So, and then hold down B to create a branch and left click. You can also just do this. Search for branch. Go ahead and create a branch and hook it up like so. So if we can jump, then we want to perform our parent's jump. So if you don't already have this node, you can just right click and say add call to parent function and it will create one for you. But basically all this is doing is it's calling the parent's jump function. And the parent's jump function is our jump component bases jump function, which if you remember, uh, inside of here, we just put the normal Unreal Engine forward jump. So it's basically saying when the jump key's pressed, um, if we can jump, go ahead and do the normal jump. But then we want to actually start the glide jump. So over here on the left, we want to create a few private functions for starting and stopping and updating the glide. So select the function button or click the function button. And the first one is begin glide. And we want this to be private. And we'll go ahead and add it to a private category. We can just go ahead and duplicate this um, twice. So duplicate it once and duplicate it twice. And then the second one we'll call in glide. And the third one we'll call tick glide. So in the begin, begin glide function, um, the way this is going to work is whenever the gliding is enabled, we're going to enable tick for the component. And whenever it's not enabled, we're going to disable the tick. So that way the component's only going to be ticking whenever it really needs to. And the only time it needs to is when you're actually doing the glide. And that's going to both save on performance because we're not going to have this component being ticking all the time when it doesn't need to. And it's also going to just kind of make our code more organized because the tick function is kind of going to be our glide function. So we don't need to create an extra function for it. But one thing we need to do before we can um, write that functionality is we need to make sure that by default, the component is not ticking. So to do that, we actually want to do that in the jump component base function because we want this logic applied to all jump components. So go, to the, go back to the jump component base function real quick, quick. And at the top under class settings, I don't remember where it is. Um, up under class defaults. Yeah, so class defaults and then search for tick. And then there should be a start with tick enabled. We want to uncheck that. So that's saying, hey, don't, um, like when the game first starts, don't let this component tick. We only want it to tick if we tell it to tick later on. So if you compile and save that, it should update it in your child ones as well, but you should probably double check. So if you go to the strafe jump and you go to the class settings, you can see start with tick enabled is now false. And same with the glide one is now false. So now by default, um, back in our glide component, if you look at our event tick, it's not gonna actually be ticking by default, which is, which is good. So when we do the begin glide, we'll come back here now, we want to actually enable the tick. So to do that, we'll just say set component tick enabled and we'll set it to true. And then the next thing we want to do is we want to kind of start a timer so that we know how long we want him to glide for. And like I showed you at the beginning, the glide, like the amount of time that he glides for, as well as you know how he glides and everything that involves with gliding is controlled by that float curve. So we need to actually go and create a float curve first so that we can make use of it in here. So back over here, let's right click and under miscellaneous, there is a curve. And then we wanna select curve float uh, for a float curve. And then we'll call this the glide curve. So if you double click on this, it's basically just a line graph. It's very similar to like a timeline if you used one of those before in Unreal. But I'm just going to go ahead and fill this out the same way I have it in my example project, just because I've kind of spent a little bit of time tweaking it to get it look kind of nice. But feel free to modify these values as much as you want um, after you get it working. So right click and add a key. The first key we want to be at zero. 
and for the y we want 400 so we're saying at zero seconds the velocity is going to be 400 and if you left click somewhere and press f it will kind of focus you back to wherever that put it and then to the right of that somewhere right click again and say add key and for this one we want it to be at 0 0.5 so 0 0.5 and the y value we want to be at 750 and again if you press f it will nicely um, fit both of them on the screen and then we want to add two more so to the right of this one right click again and say add key and this one we want to be at two seconds and for the value we want it to be zero because we're saying after two full seconds we want our character to have no velocity so he just kind of floats there and again i'm going to press f just so it kind of centers everything and then to the right of that one you can make another key and i have mine set to four and then press f again just so it's focused okay so basically we're saying at zero seconds his velocity is going to be 400 at 0.5 seconds is going to be all the way up at 750 and then after a total of two seconds he's just going to hover and he's going to hover for a total of two seconds because there's two seconds between this one and this one and again you can totally adjust these however you want um, one thing that would be good to do is just highlight all of these and then select this cubic interpolation up here and that'll kind of smooth out the curve a little bit so it's not so like choppy all right so that's good we'll go ahead and save that and then we want to get access to this curve inside of our oh actually we don't quite want it to do this so if you highlight that one because we don't really want it to go below one there make it something more like that file and save that okay so yeah we want to get access to this curve inside of our glide jump so if we go back to our glide jump we want to make a variable for it so over in the left select variable and we'll call it the glide curve and we want the type to be uh, float curve so go ahead and select float curve and again this could be private and we can set the category to private as well and if we compile and save this we'll get a little default value that pops up over here and by default we want it to be set to the glide curve all right so now that we have our glide curve set we can go um, back to our begin play which we're already inside of and when we or not our begin play our begin glide so when the glide begins, we want to save the starting value of this curve. So we're going to right click, or sorry, we're just going to drag in this glide curve and we're going to drag off that and say get time range. So this is going to return to us the range of the curve. So it's in this case, it's going to return zero because this is at zero and it's going to return four. So the min is going to be zero and the max is going to be four. And we want to save the min because that's the time we're starting at. So promote to variable. And I'm going to drag this into the private section and rename it to um, glide timer. And we'll go ahead and mark it as private as well. So now that we have the glide timer set, we can go ahead and start filling out our tick glide function. So over here in tick glide, um, one thing we want to do is make this take in the delta seconds. So add a variable, select float, and I'm going to call it delta seconds. So each frame, this is going to get called, and each frame we want to increment the glide timer. So drag in the glide timer and say float plus, and we want to add the delta time to it. And then we want to set it back to whatever that value is. So drag it in and set it. And then once it's set, we want to make sure that it's still within this uh, min and max time. So to do that, we can use a handy little function called float in range. And this returns true if the float value that we pass in is between this min and this max. So the value we're passing in is of course our glide timer and our min and our max are gonna be these values. So I'm just gonna copy our code from back here in our begin glide and go to our tick glide and paste it in here. All right, and then off of this, we can make a branch Okay, so we're saying increment the glide timer, and if we're, you know, check if we're still inside of the range. Like, should we still be gliding, basically? 
And if we should still be guiding, we're going to go ahead and do some, some stuff. But the easy case is the false, because it's saying, okay, we are, you know, we've surpassed our limit of our curve. So we want to just go ahead and drag in the end glide function. And we'll go ahead and fill this out real quick as well, because we haven't done that yet. So inside of end glide, it's going to be super simple. All we want to do is set the component tick back to disabled. So set component tick enabled, and make sure you leave this unchecked. And let me just double. Okay, yeah, I did set it back there. Okay. So that's all our end glide is going to do. So back into our tick glide, we're saying, okay, if the curve is totally finished, we're just going to head and end the glide. Otherwise, we want to override the velocity to whatever the velocity is inside of the curve at this point in time. So to do that, let's go ahead and we'll say get owning character. And we'll get the character move component because that's how you modify the velocity. So get character movement. It's probably at the bottom. Yeah, get character movement. And we want to drag off this and say set velocity. And go ahead and hook that up to the true. Make sure you hook it up to the true and not off of end glide. So we can go ahead and split this because we only want to modify the z value. Um, the x and the y we want to leave exactly the same. So since we want to leave them the same, we're just going to drag off of this again. Oops. Drag off of this again and say get velocity. Get velocity. And oops. And go ahead and split this again and hook the x into the x and the y into the y. So that way we're not actually changing the x and the y. We're only going to be changing the z. So now all we need to do is fill out this z value. And again, the z value is going to come from our glide curve. So go ahead and drag in the glide curve and say get float value. And what this is going to do is it's going to get us the y value of the curve at this time, which is x. So the time is our glide timer. So go ahead and drag that in. And that is going to be our z. Now we could leave it just like this, and it would work in most cases. But there is one little thing I noticed about this that if you're already running up, or if you're already moving up very quickly and then you try to do a glide jump, it'll actually slow you down because it's actually going to slow you down to whatever is inside of the glide curve, even if the glide curve um, value is lower than your current velocity. So we really want to take the max of our current z and the value from the curve and set it to that. So drag off of z up here and say max float and then hook that into there and then hook this up there. So this way, it just kind of makes it so that there's no way we can actually slow down our upwards velocity from jumping because that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, so now that we have this, I think we might actually be done. Oh, uh, one thing we want to do is inside of the functions over here on the left, we want to also override the stop jumping. And when the player elects to stop gliding, or stop jumping, which is essentially letting go of the space key, we want to stop the glide as well. So we're just going to drag in an in glide and put it in between these two calls, like so. OK, so now back in our third person character blueprint. So click on this guy and then open up this character blueprint. So inside of here, we want to make a few little modifications so that we can actually make use of this jump component. And it's going to be pretty simple. So up here in the begin play, the first thing we need to do is actually create the jump component. So search for event begin play. And off of this, we want to say uh, add jump component. And we want to add the glide jump component. So click on the glide jump component. And off of this, we want to right click and promote to variable. And this is going to be our jump component. Now, one thing that's really important to do, uh, don't mess this up, is we want to change this from the BP glide jump to the base class because this variable can store any type of jump. It doesn't have to be the glide jump. It could be the strafe jump or some other type of jump that you create in the future. So make sure you go ahead and change this to BP underscore. Um, why is that not showing up? BP underscore, or I think I called it jump. Yeah, jump component base and change variable type. And it all should still work just fine because it's a child of it. So I'm just going to add a comment to this saying create the jump component. All right, so now we have the jump component created. 
the only thing we need to do now is actually call those jump functions and stop jump functions and all that stuff. So down here at the bottom, or not at the bottom, um, towards the bottom where it does the jumping code, we kind of want to hijack this a little bit. So we want to delete the jump and the stop jump in, and we want to replace it with our own. So we're going to drag in the jump component, and we're going to say jump. So we're calling our jump, and we're going to do the same thing for stop jumping. So stop jumping. All right, and I believe that's really all we need to do for right now. So if you go ahead and run this, and I jump, you can see I still jump as normal. And if I hold down space, why is nothing happening? Oh, because we never actually called the tick function. That's probably why. So back in the glide jump component in the event graph, we just need to call our tick glide function inside of our event tick. And one more thing we're going to do is, I forgot to do this as well, inside the jump function, we want to call our begin glide function right after we jump. Okay, so now if we go ahead and run this and we hold down space, you can see I start doing my glide as soon as I start holding down space and eventually it will fall you to the ground. And if you let go early, then it will fall to the ground early. So that is our glide jump. And it seems to be working pretty well. Let me just make sure. There's no bugs with it. Yep, that seems to be all correct. Okay, so now that we have this one working, the strafe jump should be pretty easy because we're going to be copying a lot of this code. So let's go back to our content directory and open up our strafe jump component. So this one's going to be pretty similar to the glide jump, but we're just going to be changing a few things. So again, we want to override our jump and our stop jumping and our landed this time. Because I don't think we overrode landed. No, we didn't. Because we didn't really need landed for the other one. But for the strafe jump, we're going to need the on landed event. Okay, so inside of the jump, let's do that one first. We are just going to say, um, let me go to my code so I can reference it. Strip jump, strip jump. Okay, so inside of the jump, this one's going to be a little bit more confusing, or not not really confusing, but a little bit longer. Uh, the first thing we want to make sure is that the component tick is not already enabled, because we don't want to be able to strafe like while we're already strafing. So if we right click and say is component tick enabled, and we're going to drag over this and say not boolean and then create a branch off of this. So if tick is not already enabled, the next thing we wanna make sure is that, or the next thing we wanna check is if we're currently falling. Because if we're currently falling, then we wanna do a strafe. Otherwise, we wanna do the normal jump. So we'll say get owning character, and we wanna get the character movement component. And we wanna check if I can click, is falling. Create a branch off of that. And hook it up like so. So if he is currently falling, then we want to do the strafe. But if he's not currently falling, then we just want to do our normal parent jump. So we'll hook that up. Okay, so now to do the actual strafe. So there's a few variables we're going to create over here to keep track of some stuff. The first one, go ahead and create a variable, is going to be our strafe curve. So strafe curve. And this is going to be of type strafe, or sorry, float curve, float curve. And we're going to make it private and move to a private category. And we want another variable for, actually, just go ahead and duplicate this one so it keeps all the properties. And we're going to call it max strafes and set it to an integer. We're gonna make another variable called, oops, I keep doing that. Just, it's easier if you duplicate it because it keeps all the private and all that stuff set the same. Call it strafe timer and we'll set it to a float and then duplicate this one. We'll call it strafe direction. And we want to set this to a vector 2D. 
and we want one more. So duplicate it again and call it strafe count. And this is going to be an integer. Okay, so for the strafe curve and the max strafe, we want to change a few variables on these. So click on strafe curve, and then over here we want to set it to instance editable, blueprint read only, and expose on spawn. And for max strafes, we want to do the exact same thing. So instance editable, blueprint read only, and expose on spawn. And for the max strafes, we want to set this to some default value other than zero, because this is essentially how many times the player can do a strafe while he's in the air. So I'm just going to keep it at one, but if you want to be able to strafe twice, like before landing, then you can set it to two or three or whatever you want. I'm just going to use one. And then the strafe curve, we need to set it to something. So we need to go ahead and create a strafe curve real quick. So let's go ahead and do that. So back in the constant directory next to the glide curve, let's go ahead and create another one. Actually, I'm just going to duplicate this one. I think it'll be a little bit easier. We'll call it strafe curve. So if we double click and open this one up, it's going to actually kind of look pretty similar to this one, but we're just going to tweak a few values. So this first one at zero, we're going to set to 800. And this one we are going to set to 0 0.2 seconds, and we're going to set it to 1,000. And again, these y values are the velocity and the x values are the time. And then we don't actually need this last one, but the one before that, we want to set to 0 0.5 seconds, and we want to set to a value of 350. And then I'm just going to left click somewhere and then press F so we can see our curve right here. So this is our velocity. You can see it's going to start out, it's going to strafe us um, very quickly, and then it's going to kind of fall off until we get down to about 350 velocity. And then the strafe is going to end. So that's our strafe curve. So we'll go back to the strafe component and we'll go ahead and set that to our strafe curve. And then now that we have all these variables, we can kind of start uh, writing the logic to do the strafe itself. So again, we were checking if we are currently in the air. So if we are in the air, we want to try to do the strafe jump if we can. So we want to make sure that we have enough strafes left. So drag in the strafe count and we'll say, hey, is this value, um, is it still less than our max strafes? And if it is, we'll drag off this and do a branch. So this is essentially just checking, you know, do we have enough strafes left? Uh, if we do have enough strafe left, then let's go ahead and do the strafe and use one of them. So drag in the strafe count and say increment. So this will increment it by one. And then we'll go ahead and begin the strafe. So just like we did for the glide jump, we're going to create three functions, one for beginning, one for ending, and one for ticking the strafe. So create a new function. We'll call it begin strafe. And these are going to be private functions, so we'll mark them as private and add it to a private category. And duplicate. And duplicate again. Call this one in strafe. And we'll call this one tick strafe. Alright, so back here in our jump function, we wanted to call begin strafe, so let's go ahead and call it. And I guess you can go inside here and actually write the begin strafe function. So just like we did for the glide jump, when the strafe jump begins, we want to enable the tick. So we'll say set component tick enabled and make sure you set it to true. And then we want to set the velocity of the character based off of the strafe curve. So again, let's drag in the strafe curve and we'll say get time range. And we want to set our strafe timer to the minimum time so that we know when it starts. And finally, we want to calculate the direction that they're trying to strafe in. Because whatever buttons they're holding down, like if they're holding down A for left, then we want the strafe to go left. It doesn't matter if they start hitting D or W or S in the middle of the strafe. They're going to be strafing whatever direction they pressed at the beginning of the strafe. So we want to save that right here and begin strafe. So to do that, um, there's a handy little function. Um, if we get the owning character, there's a handy function called get last movement input vector. And it basically returns what um, direction the player last elected to move in, which is exactly what we want. Except instead of a vector, uh, we just want the 2D version of it because we only care about the forward and the side. We don't care about up and down necessarily. So we want to convert to a vector 2D, which is going to get rid of the Z or the up component. 
And we want to normalize this so that it has a unit length of just one. And we want to use this as our straight direction. Um, but there's one little edge case here that we have to account for is that if the player isn't isn't pressing W, A, S, or D at all, then this is just going to be zero because they're not going to have any input. And in that case, we still want to strafe them in some direction. Uh, and by default, I'm just going to say, okay, just strafe in whatever direction you're facing if you're not actually pressing any input. So we want to check if this is a zero. So we'll say is zero, 2D. And if it is, or, so we'll drag a branch off of that and hook this up. That looks good. So if it is zero, then we want to set it to whatever direction the character is facing. So we'll say get owning character, get actor forward vector, and we want to convert that to a vector 2D, which it will do automatically if you just drag it over and hook it up. But otherwise, we want to use whatever the last um, movement input mode was. So I'm just going to create a little reroute node here. And we will just set the strafe direction to that, like so. All right, so that is our begin strafe function. Compile and save it. So back in the event graph, let's do this before we forget to do it like we did last time. Go ahead and hook up the tick strafe function. Um, oh, and we need to add a delta seconds parameter to it. So over here, create a new input float, call it delta seconds. And then back in the event graph, make sure we hook that up. Okay, so we can go ahead and write tick strafe function now. So the tick strafe, again, it's going to be pretty similar to the tick glide function, um, at least towards the beginning of it. So the first thing we want to do, just like we did before, is we want to increment the strafe timer. So drag in the strafe timer and say float plus, and we want to add the delta time to it. And then we want to drag it in and set it to whatever the new value is. And we want to make sure that this is still within the range of the curve, just like we did before. So we'll say float in range. And our value is our strafe timer. And our min and our max are going to be from our strafe curve. So drag in our strafe curve and say get time range. And this is the min and the max. And we'll drag this and make a branch to see if it's true or false. So again, if it's false, which means we've, you know, we've strafed for as long as we can strafe for based on the curve, then we want to go ahead and end the strafe. So drag an end strafe. And I'm just going to double click on this and fill it out real quick because it's super simple. It's the same as the other end strafe. We're just going to say set component tick enabled to false, like so. Okay, so back in the tick strafe function, uh, assuming that we are actually still performing the strafe, we want to set the velocity based off of this curve. So again, we're going to drag in our curve and we're going to say get, oops, get float value and it's going to be our strafe timer. Uh, except this time we want to we don't want to set our velocity to this exactly. We want to multiply it by our strafe direction so that way we actually move in the direction we're trying to strafe in. So drag in our strafe direction and say float multiply and hook that up. So this is going to be our new velocity on our x and our y. So to set it, we'll do just like we did before, get owning character, um, get character movement at the bottom here and set velocity and hook that up. Now this time we actually don't want to affect the z value at all. So we're going to split this and we only want to affect the x and the y. So the x and the y are going to be whatever this vector 2d is and we can't just quite drag it in. So we're going to need to split it. And you can see we get an x and a y here. So we'll hook up our x and we'll hook up our y. All right, so we are pretty much, or we're, we're almost done with this. Um, the very last thing we need to do is this on landed function. So essentially, we need this function because we want to limit the amount of times that the player can perform the strafe while he's in the air. But whenever they hit the ground and they start walking around again, we want to be able to reset that value so that the next time they jump, they can strafe again. So whenever they land, we're just going to say um, set the strafe count back 
to zero, which will allow them to strafe again once they jump. Now, this on landed function is not currently being called from anywhere, so we need to go ahead and do that real quick in our third person character. So go back to our third person character, and then we can just override the on landed event, and we'll drag in our jump component and just say on landed, so that way it gets called whenever the character lands, like so. All right, so I think we might have everything done. Let me just double check that all these are filled out and I didn't forget anything. Um, yeah, we don't actually need stop jumping. It's fine if we overrode it, but we don't actually need it for anything in this case. That's totally fine. So, okay, so all these are filled out. So let's go ahead and test this. So back in our third person character, uh, instead of creating the glide component, let's go ahead and add the strafe component. So we'll say add PP strafe jump component. And we'll hook this up. Oh, okay, well, that's fine. And hook that up, and then make sure you hook it up to the jump component as well. And we can, I'm just going to leave this one here for reference. But um, I, you can see I accidentally exposed the strafe curve. I didn't mean to do that. So let's go in here, or not in there. Let's go back to the strafe jump component and just get rid of um, expose on spawn for the strafe curve. We don't really care about that. And we might need to refresh this. Yes, we do. Okay, so you can see I did expose the max strafe, so that way you can easily set that when you create the component. But let's go ahead and test and see if it actually works. So if I jump and hold down left and jump again, you can see I do a strafe, and it does it whatever way I am currently pressing. And if I jump and don't press any keys and I just press space again, you'll see it goes in whatever direction the um, player is facing. So yeah, I think that works pretty well. But, and let's see, if we change this to like two, for example, we should be able to strafe once and strafe again twice, and that seemed to work. Let me just double check that if I set this to one, it only lets me do it once, because I didn't actually verify that. All right, it seems like it does. So everything should be working good. And of course, if we go and we change this back to the glide jump component, then we should be able to now glide jump instead of strafe. So yeah, it's just that simple. Um, you can obviously switch these out at runtime, as I'm doing right here. I'm just happening to be doing doing it in the begin play, but you could make it so that if they unlock, you know, different strafe or different jumps, you can switch out the components at runtime, which makes it, you know, super flexible. So you're not locked into a specific jump for a specific character. And you can also even switch out these curves, you like per character if you want. So like some characters strafe um, faster than others, or you know, there's all sorts of possibilities with the way it's set up right now. So if you enjoyed the tutorial, um, please leave a like and subscribe. Thanks.